What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Community Voices. Today, we got a very special guest. We got the Delani Gazimbi. You How got it right on the mark. Yeah, yeah, Delani. Nice to meet you. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. The pleasure is ours. So, yeah, let's jump right into it. So, you know, tell the people about, you know, who you are and what you do. So, uh, you know, I, I think most relevantly, I'd say that, you know, I'm a, a, a brand owner. I'm, a, I'm the designer. I'm the mm-hmm the creative director started a brand called the rad black kids in 2014 and um you know since then it's just been like uh, not only has it been a hustle but it's been interesting seeing how a brand that's focused on um i'd say in the beginning it started as a way in which i felt like there were so many disparities and one of the disparities i saw in the world is that black people couldn't necessarily even tell our own stories in a lot of capacities yeah. so i felt as though one of my talents was I can tell stories through clothes. So when I start a brand and have it centered around the idea that at least with this and this little micro world, we get to control the narratives, you know, like seeing something as simple, like, you know, a black dude on a t-shirt is something that a lot of people don't realize isn't really something that's in the mainstream, you know? Absolutely. And so just like simple things like that, having people have a brand that reflects you know themselves or a brand that's expressive in terms of like the true nature of like people or things you know and so i'd say that's what i've pushed to do and that's kind of who i am now absolutely you know clothes are art and art is a form of expression you know yeah for sure i'd say so like you know the the interesting thing about you saying that is that inspiration is an interesting thing so i've heard all these comedians talk about george carlin that every year he would come up with a new stand-up special and he'd like scrap the old one and write the new one yeah so i'm creating two collections a year it's an interesting thing because you can only tell so much of a story based around the things that you see and now things go a little bit deeper so you know a few years back i, I learned about this samurai who was you know this he was a, a ex-black he was a black slave taken from mozambique to japan mm. and, and i think it was the 1500s And this guy ended up becoming a samurai and fighting for Nobunaga, right? So he fights for this guy. And the next thing at some point, like, you know, he fights to unify Japan. And then there's like some battle with another samurai clan. They kill all the other dudes. This dude survives. Basically, his story falls off the map. And then like this dude, he just disappears. So you'll find this Edo period art with this one random black character in there. Yeah. So we based the mascot of the brand off like this mythical story of what if he had a great, great grandson that was like a skateboarder, you know, like a black mm-hmm. dude who's a skater. And so with every collection, not only is the art pretty dope, but I try and bring a lot of depth and a lot of context based around historical events that people could kind of see a different image of like, you know, what blackness looks like compared to what's on the mainstream. Sure. And there's actually this show on Netflix called, I want to say Yasuke. That's kind of, it's like an anime. That's right. Kind of based roughly on that samurai. So, yeah, it's it, it's so wild, man. It's, uh, it, 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 it's, I think it's produced by uh, Flying Lotus. Yeah. The soundtrack so, on it is amazing. The soundtrack is amazing. That's Flying Lotus. I, I met him randomly one day at a bar in, in Tokyo. It's another mm-hmm. story for another day. But the crazy thing about that is we named our character Kasuke with an X instead of a Y and we based it all on that same character. And you know what's so funny about like the cyclicality of things is we came out with that character in like 2018, 2017, 2018. So it's like, it's it's been a while, you know. For sure. And a little birdie told me that you're into action sports. So tell me about that. How, how long you been into that? Man, it's 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 a crazy thing, you know. Grew up in Zimbabwe, moved to the States when I was 17. Mm-hmm. Six months after moving to the States, I'm in church one day and this lady was saying some wild stuff. And I don't, you know, like, I, I don't even know what it had to do with. And then she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. She realized it wasn't me, you know. Mm-hmm. And then she's like, come snowboarding with my family tomorrow. I'm like, man, you know, the, the answer in my mouth is black people don't snowboard. And she's like, yeah, you will. And so next thing I know, ended up going up and I'll tell you, I'd never, I never really skateboarded before. And mm-hmm. so this was my first time on a board. And from that day, I think at about 2 p.m. in the afternoon, started like, you know, 9 a.m. in the morning, I finally stood up and I was hooked. So living in Idaho back then, like during the winter, there's basically nothing to do. So basically over the winters for like the next eight years, like I was going up snowboarding at least one day, like out of the weekends in the winter. 
Yeah. And so I, I really, really got into it. Like, strangely enough, the first friends I made in America were people, you know, snowboarding, were like the people I met when I was snowboarding. So that kind of, you know, made me feel at home. That was the first thing I did that made me feel like, you know. So basically, like, you know how trends and just industry just evolves constantly. So, so you, from like your experience, how often does the industry evolve? And is like, is it difficult just keeping up with different trends, especially when it comes to your art with the clothing or even just like a snowboarding and things like that? I, I think the interesting thing with trends is that trends have now been co-opted so often by fast fashion that using a trend as a measure for how you do your business is probably an incorrect thing. Yeah. Because the other thing that we have now is we have the internet, right? Mm -hmm. And so let's say if we look at speculatively, let's say if fast fashion didn't exist, we still could be like indulging in trends and just moving things that way. Yeah. But I feel as though the, the real dangerous part with using trends alone as a barometer is that you kind of ignore who your, your niche could be, or even if you could have a niche or, or, or so on, you know? Mm -hmm. So then the interesting part that I feel about like trends is I don't think they're a good thing. I think having your own voice and I think being able to design with your own kind of feeling and, and idea and like having like a really unique message will create a, a really unique audience. And then super serving that audience, I think is still a valuable thing because that audience isn't necessarily buying from you from the trend. They're buying from you because your message, your art, it resonates with them. Yeah. And so that's kind of how we've been moving since we started the brand, you know? Nice, thanks. And then what would you say would be like the biggest obstacles you, you know, encounter when dealing with your brand? I'd say the biggest obstacle is similar to like a lot of black brands, you know, is um, um, basically it's funding, you know, like, I, I mean, you know, I don't want to air anybody's business or anything, but it's like, you know, working with bigger companies requires a particular a certain amount of investment capital you know and like i've known some some companies that have had the opportunity to be able to like work with bigger stores but they just don't have the investment capital to either go into a production run and get it done or they don't have the investment capital to do you know to get like i don't know to to get the software that the company requires them to use to do like data transmissions for like invoices you know Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 more often than not, I find that black companies, even the companies that look like they're thriving, yeah. even the companies that look like they're doing super, super well are all running into the same problems. And I mean, we could look at that as being coincidence, but why is it coincidentally all the companies of yeah. color? You know what I'm saying? So I'd say like, just like everybody else who you might interact with, if you ask them the same question, they might have the same response, you know? Yeah, for sure. So... Speaking about your clothing brand, talk to us about how you started the Rad Black Kids. So uh, it, it's actually like a, a pretty interesting story because I graduated top of my class. I was, uh, they, they didn't formally call valedictorian. I was graduation speaker. Basically, I was valedictorian of the class. I graduated with an energy, energy management master's degree, first black student, first international student, first of a lot of things. And then actually I had a, a, a certificate that went along with that environmental management. So that was water. My energy management degree was like renewables. I was specializing in micro energy generation, you know, like things for rural areas and, in, in, you know, the, the developing world, you know, like little devices people could use at home. I went to school in New York, moved to California. And when I tell you I applied for 500 jobs, that's not a, you know, that's, sound, that's not a, a, what's the word here? That's not hyperbole. Right. Like literally it was 500 jobs. So I applied for all those jobs and I couldn't even land an interview. Mm -hmm. And so when you're looking at the fact that your grades are good and you're looking at the fact that you did the school thing and that was- it's Like you did everything right. Did everything right, right? Like, I mean, I remember <laughs> the first day of class in my master's, I went to school after the gym and I saw all these kids that look serious. Mm -hmm. And I was in gym clothes. And I remember just being like, I don't want to look like the idiot here. So that literally, <laughs> that literally got me in gear to like work yeah. really, really hard. And before I knew it, the degree is over and now I have this degree. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know, man, like at the time, you know, I was, I, I had a, a, a permit. I was still, still didn't have a green card or anything. And I had to find a job. 
and I couldn't find work and all this stuff happened. And then eventually I remember like I was down, man. I started reading all these articles about how non-American sounding names are less likely to be called for interviews and so on. Mm -hmm. And I remember my sister came to visit me and she asked me about what's going on. And I told her that I broke down in front of her. I was like, I don't even know what else to do at this point. She's like, you should start a company. And I thought to myself, when I started the company, I was like, you know what? I'm going to start a company so no other Black person can feel this way ever again. You know? yeah. And so that's why I pluralized the name from the jump was I was like, this isn't just me. This is like all of us. Yeah. And so in the beginning, I started building skateboards and longboards. I'd done that before. I'd actually done that because in the summer, there was nothing to do in Idaho. So yeah. my first longboard, I couldn't afford one. So this uh, friend of mine gave me a board and I just shaped it, cut it up. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, man. And so from that point on, started, you know, building skateboards. And then about six months later, did my first clothing collection. And yeah, that's the genesis. That's beautiful. So... I hear you also, you plant 20 trees per product sold. So how do you come up, how did that like even cross your mind as far as like planting the trees and how many trees have you planted to date? So I, I'd say there's, okay, so that answer is twofold. So one thing that we did was when I did that master's, it gave me the ability to do some pretty cool stuff that at the time when you're starting a clothing brand, you're like, I don't know if I'll ever use this stuff. Right. But one of the things was, calculating the carbon tonnage in products and so basically like we did this stuff where we calculate carbon like tonnage and basic things so i figured out you know how to calculate the carbon tonnage in the boards from transportation to the raw materials to whatever and then yeah. in clothes and so the idea from the beginning was this there really doesn't need to be any more products but if there are more products and products that i'm creating <coughs> i might as well offset the carbon footprint Right. And so from there, like uh, I, I came up with the idea of over over like over uh, supply, if we can say. It, right. Yeah. So the idea was, how do you then oversupply the number of trees that like uh, uh, how, how do you oversupply the amount of carbon so that even when you're making a T-shirt, you offset this T-shirt by a lot. Mm -hmm. So eventually the, the one for one thing was really, really great because now the com company is carbon negative. When I moved, pushed it up to 20 trees, it was because when the stuff was happening in the Amazon, I was like, man, this is so bad. Like, yeah. this is very, very, very bad. Amazon is pretty important for the globe just because it supplies so much oxygen for the planet. So imagine just like people still cutting down trees over there. Like it affects like the, just all of us really. Yeah. It, affect, it affects all of us. And it's in, in such a profound way because it's like people call the Amazon the lungs of the world. Mm -hmm. And, and, and really they, it, they, they really, really are, you know. And like to think of deforestation on that scale, even what happened in Australia, like when you look at deforesta deforestation like that, it can really change the makeup and the acceleration of like this climate change because really... Yeah like all these climate goals that you hear about are about 2%. And so we're trying to reduce our emissions to 1.5% 1, 1. and yeah. not 2. But imagine if we're deforesting at that level, we're going to reach 2% because those trees are not removing that, that carbon that's in the atmosphere. Right. You know? So basically we're accelerating to this point where, you know, the people who are going to be affected by it are the poor people of the world, mm -hmm. you know? So... I'd say to this point, I think of, of planted around, I need to get back to you on this. It's about 1500 trees. Nice. And so all of them are, are with the same organization. All of them, it, all of them are with an organization that's a, in a, um, uh, works in different countries in Africa and employs an entire family to manage their own tree forest. Yeah. So sometimes it's not just a tree for us. Sometimes they'll do a, a vegetable farm or something and stimulate the local economy. But it, it's a really good organization. I've met them a couple of times. They're really good people. Nice, nice. No, that's great. I love trees. <laughs> uh, Lastly, yeah, like, it's a very special weekend. You know, we have the, well, your Inkwell collection coming out with JD Sports and Finish Line. So talk to us about the inspiration behind that. So the inspiration behind that, you know, shout out to uh, the buyer, Jay, Jay Somerville. He, he was, um, I, I got to say that he was really like an incredible asset to work with. Mm 
Yeah. And so it, it was almost like a, a boot camp, you know, it was almost like this boot camp of really like um, starting the relationship together, starting to work together, mm-hmm. starting to come up with a story. And I think the thing about this story was uh, I've been thinking a lot about heritage and I've been thinking a lot about who does heritage belong to. When you look at things like gentrification, it's almost like, you know, the people who then come in and gentrify a place are the people who will somehow have heritage and the people who are there before don't, you know. Right. Like I remember being in Harlem and walking around and hearing about the gentrification in Harlem, you know, and you, you see like um, there was that movie that came out recently about the the first black uh, millionaire, the lady who did the hair products. Yeah, and you see that there's there's that history as well of Harlem, but that history isn't the history that we see now. Yeah, and so I felt as though what is the heritage of California that's missing? And it wasn't really hard to find Inkwell Beach. This was a black beach that was there for like a, a lot of years. It was protected ironically, by segregation laws, yeah. right? The NAACP fought to keep this beach, keep, keep Black people having access to this beach. And so people use this beach. This beach also created the first Black surfers, you know, the first yeah. guys who could have gone pro, right? And so this beach is part of California culture and California-like heritage. And this beach is a relative point as to like how Black people access the ocean in California. Well, come to find out, board versus uh, Brown versus Board of Education, the, the, the yep. Supreme Court legislation that ends segregation comes out. And then one thing it presumes is that everyone has the same access to the same amount of capital. Real estate investors come in and Inquil Beach vanishes like that. It's gone. Yeah. So it. the things that were, the things that were protecting Inquil Beach are now like, you know, they were just unleashed by the end of segregation. Right. So then the thing that I find to be interesting about that is about how there's a singular narrative about surf culture in, in, in California. There's this narrative that's like through a white lens. Mm-hmm. But as someone who's in snowboarding, right, which probably has never really had a history with like black snowboarders and so on, yeah. I feel as though with surf, there's a richer history of like minorities. And, you know, there's stories about the first surfers being in Hawaii, some of the first surfers being in Ghana. And so there's, there's, there's histories and stories about how surf was a spiritual practice and not necessarily just something that was cool. Mm-hmm. I felt as though California people need to know that uh, California people of color need to know, of course, it's not just targeted to just Black people, but yeah. people need to know that this is part of the history of California, that part of who you are and part of what you know and part of what you should know should be the story about how, like, you know, we... we we were surfers once, you know, we're like beach going people who just, you know, kicked it at the ocean and had a good time. Mm-hmm. And so that was the inspiration for the collection, you know. Nice, nice. Now, I know we can't wait to see it and how it looks in store and everything. So, yeah, it's going to be a great weekend, especially for the brand. No, thank you so much. I, I, I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate you taking time to do this interview. Yeah, absolutely. The pleasure is mine. But, you know, again, thank you for the time and, you know, highlighting so many things especially within your life live a very interesting life and now seeing you know your baby being like a big global store like jd and a finish line it's a beautiful thing man congratulations no thank you so much it's a you know it's a really big opportunity and i hope i I serve the community well beautiful Mm. all right cool thank you don thanks man really appreciate what i'm so sorry what was your name again omar Omar, pleasure to meet you, Omar. I'm so sorry I didn't catch your name. No, nah, no worries, no worries. Pleasure's mine. Yeah. No, thanks so much. Thanks very much for the insightful questions, too. Yeah, for sure. All right, take All care. Right. Take care.